and our subject is the purpose of life. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. Well, what will we take into eternity? That is a pivotal question. What will you take into eternity? This is an eternity verse. And such a verse is a challenge and a test to all our values, our goals, our possessions, everything. What can you take into eternity? Puts life into context. You think of eternity, all human idols crumble. How transient, how temporary is this present material life? I think of uh, maybe uh, a historic town and they illuminate the town center and the market square in the very center of the town at nights and everything is ablaze with light. But before the lights come on, just imagine quite a group of young children playing with torches in the market square. Everything is dark. What power they feel as they direct the beams around. What fertile imaginations will think of and the games they'll play and the importance they'll assume. And then, unfortunately for them, one by one, the floodlights come on of the historic buildings and the floods irradiate the entire square and their torch beams disappear into the light and become irrelevant and nothing. Dear friends, that's a picture of our lives in the light of verses such as these. What can we take into eternity? All our aspirations and our dreams and our hopes shrivel up when you think of eternity and the ultimate purpose of life and where these things get us for that time. Is there a next world? Well, atheism says not, of course. There is no eternal life. There is no next world. There is no God. This present universe is just a mass of particles, according to atheism, without any purpose at all. All that have accidentally, by chance, various interactivities over millions of years formed the complexity of life and the systems that we know and the human body and all our thoughts and creativity all a huge accident and one day says atheism it'll disappear into oblivion and everything will have turned out to be a sheer waste of time utter futility but god's book the word of god tells us that there is a god and we are created beings, and there is eternal life and eternity to think about. This is an intelligent and a designed world, not a mere accident, not chance, and all is not moving to ultimate destruction, and these are the things we have to think about. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out, no, the universe is created by a magnificent God. Let's talk about him for a few moments before we come to the point of the verse. In these atheistic days in our land at any rate, there is staggering unawareness of the nature and the being of Almighty God. How do we even know about him? By revelation alone. We did not dream up these things we do not imagine these things. This is not of human origin. Only God can tell us about himself. Here are we, small mortal beings, shut up in a box of flesh and time. We cannot see into the eternal realm. We cannot see or grasp or understand the infinite being of God. So he must speak in. We're not surprised to have an inspired Bible. If we're to know anything about God, he must speak into us, into our world, and tell us about himself. And we have the revealed word of God. And what a description of Almighty God. 
why we could read verses 15 and 16, just for a little insight, which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power everlasting. What words they are. Well, how does God describe himself? Well, he describes himself from the oldest part of the Bible, the Old Testament. He describes himself as the eternal spirit, I am that I am. He is the great eternal being. The great spiritual being. A magnificent God. The source of all energy. The source of all life. The God who always has been. The God who requires no fuel for his existence. No input. He is the source of all energy and action and life. Almighty God. He describes himself as one God, and yet with three persons in the Godhead, all equally divine, all equally eternal, and equally God. One Godhead in perfect harmony and concert and agreement, and yet three distinct glorious personalities described to us as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he is the God who is infinite and eternal. Our minds cannot take that in. We get the words, we can begin to understand them, but we can't really grasp them. Who on earth can grasp infinity or eternity? It's impossible. We recognize the meaning of the terms, but we cannot really comprehend them. He is beyond comprehension. He is all-knowing all-seeing. There is nothing that Almighty God does not know. And when you consider that he knows all things all the time, that again is beyond our thought, that God knows everything that he does know all the time. He is God. He is not like us. We can only focus our mind in a kind of tunnel vision on one thing at a time. There are many things we know, but they're out of our conscious recall. But he knows everything that ever has happened, that ever will happen. He knows the most minute things, the most complex things. He is almighty God, the sovereign, controlling God who knows everything. And he is everywhere present. And he is all-powerful. There is nothing he cannot do. There is no one can thwart his will and his purpose. We just cannot grasp it. He is all wise. He plans for eternity. His plans and his plan of salvation is perfect and essential. Everything he does is without fault. He is holy and just. There is no stain. There is no blot. There is nothing at fault in God. And being perfect, he is unchanging. He is ever always the same. That which is perfect cannot change. If it did change, it either wasn't perfect before or it won't be perfect now. He is the immutable, the unchanging, perfect God on high. And he's love, he's loving, and he's kind, and he's approachable. Oh, our God, our glorious sovereign God, that's the God of the Bible. And then there's man in the picture. We need to understand the nature of man. That's not well understood today. Mankind, far, far above the animals. Isn't it amazing? The desperation to establish that man has emerged from a higher mammal. The highest mammal in the animal kingdom, by comparison with man, is a million miles separated. There is an immeasurable gulf. Here is man with intelligence and language and creativity and so many complex gifts and powers. There is such a gulf 
And yet, to try to do away with God and creation and the special nation, nature of man, there is this attempt to bridge. The one has simply evolved from the other. And every now and then comes another claim. A missing link has been found. A gap in the record, in the fossil record, between the highest other primate and man. And every time that happens, within a short space, either it's declared a fraud or a mistake or an irrelevance, and the scientific world decides together this should never have been proposed. And yet, if there was an evolutionary process between primates and man, well, there would be hundreds of thousands of intermediate forms available to view as fossils all over the world, representing the tiny stages that would take place between the two. And to this day, there are none. No, not one. And with tremendous shout, the evidence proclaims there is an unbridgeable gulf or chasm between primates and man. Here is man, special in the sight of God. According to the Bible, made in the image of God. Nothing like God. Man is not divine, but God has honored him with certain characteristics which mark him out from the animals and fit him for a relationship with the living God. So man has uniquely the power of reason. What a gift. We all in this place have the power of reason, the thinking mind. We all have the power of language and communication and relational skills of a very high order. We all have creativity and a determinative will. There are aspects to man simply not seen, except in tiny, minute form in the animal kingdom. Oh, dear friends, we have moral consciousness, a knowledge of right and wrong, and yet something's happened to us. We're weak. We can't obey our conscience. We know what's right, but we cannot do what's right. What a different world it would be if man could follow his conscience, but he can't. He's weak, and he's ruled much more by his greed and his hate and his spite. Oh, there are good things in every human being, but there's so much which is weak and bad also. And so the world is in a mess, and all the time in every age of history, there is oppression and wars, man against man, and all kinds of things happening, the tragedy of man. But he was made with moral consciousness. What's happened to him? He's fallen. The doctrine of the fall in the Bible, it alone explains man. Why he has a conscience, why he has these powers, and yet why he cannot live in accordance with them. He's fallen from the favor and communion with God. But he's a sinner, a sinful race, cut off and under God's condemnation. Now I'm going to come down to the text and we'll talk about this because it's so important. And then we come back to the point of man. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. As you read this, I wonder if you realize the significance of the brought and the carry. They both refer to the same thing in the Greek original. We brought nothing into this world is actually we carried nothing in and we, shall, we can carry nothing out. That word carry it's very important, and I'll tell you why. It literally means from the Greek, we did not bear a burden and bring anything in. Of course not. Think of a tiny babe comes into the world, born maybe in hospital, born maybe at home. Yes, a poor little soul comes into this world, doesn't come in through the front door, bearing great packing cases or suitcases. It doesn't arrive with its belongings. It comes in with nothing, the tiny babe. Of course it does. 
a helpless little bundle of life. The babe is conceived, formed in the womb, and born, and enters into a temporary house, this body. Just a temporary house. It'll occupy this temporary house for how long? 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, 90 at most, a few more. And then it'll go off into eternity. The adult, the old person, will pass away. Our language is interesting, isn't it? We say he's passed away, she's passed away. That's our unconscious recognition of the fact that the body has a soul. And the body is dead, but the soul's passed on. It's our instinct. We know it to be true. But the babe, when the babe comes, brings nothing into this world, and it is certain. That means it's, it's manifest, it's visible, it's obvious that we can carry nothing out. Of course not. The person has died. That dear person is now prostrate, lifeless has no strength or power, cannot pack up things and go with them. It's absolutely certain you can take nothing out. And yet, it's a certainty which isn't in our minds. We don't think of it. We have to go. The soul will move on and give an account to God for the life lived in the body. Whether we've ignored God, paid him no homage, rendered him no service, given him no love, given him no worship, given him no trust and reliance, given him no obedience to his laws and his standards. We've got to move on and give account. It is certain we can take nothing with us except our souls and our guilt and stand before him. We can take more if we've come to him, if we've been forgiven, and I'll tell you what we take in a few minutes. You can take so much more if you've repented of your sin and come to know him and walk with him. But oh, dear friends, without that, we can take nothing. And yet we don't worry about it. We don't think of it. We don't plan our lives with this in view. The purpose and the ultimate destination of life's journey you can take nothing with you. You cannot take any authority you wield. You cannot, maybe, you're in charge. You run a big department, perhaps the entire company. You have important status. You can't take that with you to stand before God. You can't take your pleasures, your sinful pleasures. You cannot take your possessions. You cannot take anything. I love the old uh, verse of the poet James Montgomery. The arrow that shall lay me low was shot from death's unerring bow the instant of my breath. And every moment I proceed, it tracks me with unceasing speed. I turn, it meets me. Death hath given such instinct to that dart. It points forever at my heart. The day is decreed when I must leave this body and pass as a disembodied soul into the presence of God and stand before him to give account. You can't take your athletic skill with you. You can't take your creative gift with you. There's nothing you can take with you. If you're not saved, if you've never come to Christ, you can only take your guilt, your record, your sin burden. That's all. You can't take your body when you go home, stand in front of the mirror, just look at yourself, and if you like, address your body and say, I cannot take you with me. I've got to take leave of you, and I've got to go alone and stand before my Creator who I've despised, who I've neglected. That's realism, dear friends. The poet says, and I imagine he was looking at himself, the poet says, and you, my fleshly clay, 
long partner of my cares. In that rough veil, a torn away with pain, regret and tears, you take leave of your body and you go before Almighty God. Naked came I out of my mother's womb, said Job, and naked shall I return. That's the truth. That's the realism. But my guilt, if I've never sought the forgiveness of God, that clings to my soul. I've gone out of the sphere of grace. No pardon for me now if I die without forgiveness on earth. Too late, I've given nothing to the Lord that I owed him. No love, no thanksgiving, no respect, no obedience. And I go before him to be judged and banished from his presence eternally. But friends, there's a much better history. You can have a much better biography than that. You can have something so much better. There is a next world. There is a God. And you can seek him and you can find him even now. I turn back to chapter 3 and verse 16. Listen to these words. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's Christ. He came. Justified in the spirit, he lived a perfect life. Seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Christ has come. Isn't it amazing? Do you ever think of this? That Christ, the eternal God through whom the worlds were made, the member of the triune Godhead to whom was deputed the task of creating the universe, so felt for the plight of us foolish lost sinners, rebels against God and rejecters of him, that he among the Godhead said, I will go into that world of time and enter into a body and I will suffer and die for them and I will bear the punishment of sin for all who will be forgiven. I will purchase the right to pardon and forgive them freely by bearing their punishment for them. And I will be their savior. And he came. That's what happened the first Christmas. He came and entered in to human body and personality and he grew up and he lived that perfect life and he demonstrated his power and his approachability and his kindness with countless mighty acts of healing power and mercy. And then he went to the cross of Calvary. And on that cross he spread his arms and, as it were, said to his heavenly Father, Punish me. And for six hours he bore our eternal weight of punishment. A punishment far, far deeper than anything we can possibly contemplate because God poured out upon him all the divine wrath against our sin if we are among those who repent and seek him. And he bore it all away. What love is this? That our sins can be forgiven, that we can know the living God, that we can walk with him, we can come to him. Oh, dear friends, look at the text again. Well, I'll read 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness means communion with God, being in touch with him. That's great gain. In the Greek, mega gain, if you like. And the Greek word translated gain means a way, a means. This is the greatest imaginable means of mercy and forgiveness and life. What happens to you when you come to Jesus Christ? What does he do in your life? What does he give you? Well, he gives you pardon. All your sins dissolved and your guilt removed. He gives you communion. That is to say, he brings you in touch with himself. 
and you can pray. You're given the gift of prayer and you can walk with him and love him and appeal to him and seek his help and you know it. One of the great wonders of the Christian life is you know your prayers are heard and you receive so many answers to your prayers and this great river of proof runs through your life. He gives you understanding. He gives you a new nature, a new nature. You have power over so many of your sins. You have a new way of thinking. You have a new love for God. All oh, these things are very profound. You have new tastes. You have interventions of God in your life where he helps you and he blesses you constantly. You have an eternal friend and you have eternal life. That's what happens when you come to Christ for forgiveness. Spiritually, you were a vagrant. Now you become a billionaire spiritually. I'm not talking about God making you rich. He doesn't do that, but he makes you rich in experience and in strength and in depth and in so many wonderful ways. So in life and in death, he is your God and he is with you. What do you take with you now when you die? Look at the first, first seven. We brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out, nothing material. Ah, oh, but if you come to Christ, there are things you can take out because you're given things of a spiritual nature which will last all your life and for all eternity. Let, I hope you don't mind and you don't find this rather simple, but uh, let me put it in this way. You take with you into eternity, as it were, this is just my figure, my imagination, you take a document, it's the most precious document imaginable, of course, it isn't really a document. But you take into eternity the certificate authenticating that all your sin is forgiven, that Christ has died for you, that you belong to him, that you've trusted him and come to him, and you will never be condemned. You carry it, as it were, except that it's in your heart and in your soul, you carry it into eternity. That certificate is your free passage through death into glory, into heaven, into the paradise of Christ. It's as good as if you've got it in your hand and you show it as you go and you go through immediate, free, open passage. You're a forgiven man, a forgiven woman. And you have another certificate. It's a figure. It is your certificate of adoption. You are a child of God. And you have citizenship in heaven. Adoption is a Bible word. You've been adopted into the family of God's people. You are a child of the living God. With full rights as though you deserved and earned them for yourself. You have life in your soul and you have a diary too. What a diary this is, because it's in your hearts, really. But it's a bulging diary and it's a marvelous diary. And it moves you every time you open it and read it. It is the record of your walk with God and his blessings toward you and all he's done in your life since you came to him and all the way he has led you. You've got your certificate of pardon, your certificate of adoption, your diary of spiritual experience as you walked with God. These are real and certain and eternal things, but they're all written in your heart. And you take those into the presence of God and into eternal glory. I'm sorry for the simple imagery. If only I could get it across. This is great gain, mega gain. Without Christ, without his forgiveness, 
without seeking him and finding him, all you take on your naked soul is your guilt and you tremble as the light of this world turns out and the light of the next come on, comes on and you tremble in your guilt and you've got to give an account and God, the holy and the just, will render your judgment. Come to him, dear friends, while you've breath in your body. Come to him in the words of scripture, pitiable, poor, miserable, blind, naked, no rights with him, just fall at his feet, so, oh Lord, I trust in the death of Jesus Christ. I trust in his power to forgive. Forgive me my sins, recognize them, acknowledge them, make no excuses for them. Ask him to save you and to change you and to give you a new heart and a new nature and make you his child. And he will. This is the greatest experience of life. Conversion to God. He will change you. He will make you his own. He will do it all. He will give you spiritual life. Come to him, friends. I read my text as we close. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain, nobody can contradict this, that we can carry, this particularly refers to physical things, material things, we can carry nothing out. Is that all you've got? Physical accomplishments, physical possessions, physical things, no life in the soul. If only you had that, you can take that. You can take that certificate of pardon, that certificate of adoption. You can take those. You can take that diary of conversion and spiritual experience and you have open passage into the presence of a welcoming God. This is the purpose of life, to honor him and love him and know him now and then forever. Let's pray together. Oh God, our gracious Heavenly Father, write these things upon our hearts, we ask. Oh Lord, make it impossible for any to go out of this place without any further concern for the soul, for eternity, for knowing thee here and now in this life and then forever. Oh Lord, bless us and draw us to thyself in repentance and faith in Christ alone. Bless our souls, we ask, and convert many among us. We ask it in the name of our Saviour, for his sake. Amen.